But that she goes to this old thorn, the thorn which I have described to you, and there sits in a scarlet cloak, I will be sworn is true. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Sunday Morning Poetry on the Troubadour Podcast. Today, we are going to go over the poem, The Thorn, by William Wordsworth. Now, this is another of the 1798 lyrical ballads, and I will say that, generally speaking, pretty much everybody that I've ever read, and I'm in agreement with this, would say that this is one of the, or is the top three, or the probably the third greatest poem in this collection, which is probably one of the great collections of poetry ever. So we have Ancient Mariner. We have um, Lines Written Above Tintern Abbey. And we have The Thorn, probably in that order. Although, you know, I might even, I, I as much as I really enjoy The Ancient Mariner, I might argue there's something better about Tintern Abbey, but it's really hard to compare those two. The Thorn is the third one. Now, The Thorn is similar, is uh, Wordsworth. So Ancient Mariner is written by Coleridge. Tintern Abbey is written by Wordsworth. So the second and third greatest one are written by Wordsworth. Now, this is going to be an interesting one today. I, I'm going to challenge you to try to, you know, listen through this. It's not as um, long as the Ancient Mariner, if you're familiar with that, but it is a longer poem. There's something like 28 stanzas, I believe. They're moderately short stanzas, but it'll take several minutes to read it. And I'd like to try to, it's 23 stanzas, it looks like. And I'd like to try to read it um, once through, have a, a brief discussion, give you some background, and then read it again. Now, I don't want to set up too much because one of the interesting things about the 1798 version is that when Wordsworth wrote this and he or he published it in 1798, he did not include any notes or anything like that. In the 1802 version, however, he did. He included a very long note. And then in 1820, after Coleridge published a very um, critical analysis of the thorn and gave some negative lights to certain aspects. Wordsworth rewrote it again, or he, he, um, did some heavy editing, including taking out a whole stanza. So when you go online, other than the troubadourmag.com website, pretty much everywhere you will find the 1820 version. So the last published, that's what I seem to have learned is mostly what people are putting online are the later versions, the last published version. But I want us to experience a little bit of what it's like to have read these in 1798 to some degree, to kind of get a feel. That's why I'm doing Metaphysical Mondays, so you can get a feel for the context of which these are written and they're, they're, why they're so fantastic and important, um, besides just being amazing poetry in and of itself in any era. Um, so it And it also will help you understand the poem, poem itself if you do like it, to read different versions because you can get a better feel for why they made why Wordsworth made the choices he made um, in 1798 versus 1802 versus 1820. So that's um, what I, I hope that you'll get in, out of this. Now we're also going to go into something. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to have a brief conversation, if possible, if time permitting. I don't want to go too long on imagination and fancy, which are especially. Uh, how Coleridge conceived of and viewed imagination, which is the the um, the Romantics had a very different view of imagination than I think that we even understand it, and that uh, uh, you know it, from uh, opposed to the past. So often when you read about the Romantics, and I was just l listening to some lectures about this just recently, people will say that generally speaking, the Romantics were a backlash against the classicists, right? That's probably what you learned in school. They um, were somewhat, some people maybe say anti-reason or they were, you know, uh, reacting against reason and they were pro-imagination. And that's somewhat true and somewhat false. It's not really accurate that they were against reason. From what I've gathered in reading a lot of these um, poems and, and um, their actual prefaces and what these guys actually thought and the context and such, I believe they were actually against 
rationalism. So they were against a certain form of how reason was being manifested in the 18 or in the late 1700s. This is, you know, when you're getting Kant is, is right around this time, of course, he, and you get, you, so you're getting the German metaphysics, uh, metaphysicians. And these are, I said this, I believe last time or one of the previous episodes, these are the guys who supposedly turned Coleridge insane and he died early because he tried to understand these guys. That's an exaggeration, but I don't think it's that far. Uh, I do think he, it, it drove him a little insane trying to figure out what these guys were talking about. And you, you, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of a certain form of what's called rationalism, which I'm not the best at defining, but here's how I understand it. Something along the lines of you have this, you know, given abstract concrete idea that's perfect. And that's what we're all trying to achieve. And so the, it, it gives way to something like authoritarianism where you have to obey by this, these rules. And this is where you get Aristotelian uh, or, or uh, classicism, which is based on the, something like the poetics and the ancient Greeks, which were held as, oh, they received some divine, you know, uh, knowledge. They knew what was beautiful. They knew what was sublime. They knew how people should act. They knew about, you know, philosophy and how to, and all we need to do is try to achieve what they, you know, have set out for us. So a play, for instance, has to be given 24 hours in a day. We can only set the action within a 24 hour period because that's what Aristotle said. Again, if you read Aristotle closely, I don't think that's quite what he's saying. And I don't think that's quite accurate. And even if it was, it's not the right way to approach um, life and, and art and anything. And the romantics are, are kind of bashing against this kind of rationalism where you have this ideal Oh, it has to be exactly like this. Where did that ideal come from? Who came up with that? I don't know. Somebody really old and ancient and wise. So let's kind of follow that. Versus what Coleridge and Wordsworth were about, which was imagination and fancy. And they had a very specific definition. So we'll try and get into that if we have time. But it ha the way they Coleridge defines this sounds a lot like if anybody's ever read the Objectivist Epistemology from Ayn Rand. It sounds a lot like that. I mean, the way he talks about how the five senses integrate in, um, you know, automatically. This is, everybody has what's called primary imagination, or, or uh, which is, you know, the five senses hit, are hit with the sensory object or one sense like sight, and then it, you know, brings up and in a specific manner that's very human. This is what the object is in the external world, and there's a process that's going on there, but it's a human process, and then the secondary type of imagination is what a great artist can do with that. He can see that and he can twist it in a certain way to give you a different image. And you can do that with poetry, with painting and so on and so forth. And that's what, you know, and there's a lot, obviously a lot more to it than that. That's not even a great synopsis, but I just want to give you a taste that it's much more about like, that's how I've always learned in studying uh, objectivism. What reason is, is it's, you know, the kind of the faculty that integrates the, your sensory perceptions into concepts. And so that, I think it's way more objectivist in that in uh, methodology and some degree, but there, there are some missing ingredients I think that are very important that then, you know, they fail on. But the point is that they are not anti-reason. They're very interested in how the mind actually works. They're interested in how nature actually works on the mind. Now, what you're going to get in this poem, again, as we've seen in other poems, is both of those things. When we went over Goody Blake and Harry Gill, I went over a concept called, which is a poem in 1798 um, Lyrical Ballads. What we talked about was Mutable Madness, which is from er Erasmus um, Darwin. And so is the grandfather of Charles Darwin. And he wrote a book, Zoonamia. And in that, he talked about mutable madness, which is a, basically just a way of mixing up reality with fantasy in a way. And of course, this fa this fa fascinated the uh, Wordsworth and the Romantics. And Harry Gill, uh, or Goody Blake and Harry Gill, is about a man who um, could not get cold or could not get warm. He was always freezing cold because he was cursed, or he believed he was, uh, by a woman who he stopped. He he. Um, would he caught her trying to steal some of his bushes basically so 
in the dead of winter so she could burn them for heat. And he stops her from this. She curses him and he can never again get warm for the rest of his life. And this is, a, this is used in Erasmus Darwin's uh, book uh, about as an example of um, uh, mutable madness. Now, in this, we're going to get something, I think, even deeper than we did if you listen to that podcast and that poem. Because in this one, we're really going to trace the inner thought process of a person who's going through something like that, or even something not quite as extreme uh, as, as never being able to feel warm, but someone who you know sees something. And it, we'll read this. I'll read a quote afterward uh, about superstitious men and what they their psychology is. And when we talked about other poems like the Lucy and the Matthew poems, I talked about one of his chief, one of Wordsworth's chief chief missions was to trace the inner processes of a person in a state of a certain kind of excitement. And that's one of the things he's really interested in. So in strange, strange fits of passion, I have known you get this writer who a lover is going to his uh, woman's house. And the things that nature does, particularly how the moon slowly drops and then crashes to nothing, how that happens in a state of dreariness and, and the feelings he get, and then he, he gets along the way. And then he gets this, raw emotion of terror that maybe he'll get to her house, her cottage, and she'll be dead. And so this is, you know, I've said this before, but I'll say it probably more times than you want to hear. One of the tasks and the goals of the romantics was to uh, really trace and understand the inner soul and inner life of a human. I think that's one of the big di changes in, in literature that occurs at this era. The way that Hugo, Victor Hugo puts it, is there's one thing grander than the sea, that is the sky. There's one thing grander than the sky, that is the interior of the soul. And you don't get that as much. You don't, you do get, of course, soliloquies and things like that with Shakespeare. So you get a little bit of the inner world, of course, but they're not to the degree and not as much as you do with the romantics. They are obsessed with what's going on in your soul. In you, like the conflicts of values that you have, why you, why the world and nature, you know, infringes and impinges on your mind and how it makes you feel emotionally and what that does to you. Okay. So let's read this poem because I'm already taking longer than I wanted and we'll go through it and we will, like I said, I'll, I'll try to go quickly to, um, then go through it again, a little slower and give you some feedback or give you some background information that Wordsworth explained in his uh, preface or his, I should say, his, uh, 1802 version of this. Okay, The Thorn by William Wordsworth. There is a thorn. It looks so old. In truth, you'd find it hard to say how it could ever have been young. It looks so old and gray. Not higher than a two years child, it stands erect, this aged thorn. No leaves it has, no thorny points. It is a mass of knotted joints, a wretched thing forlorn. It stands erect, and like a stone with lichens, it is overgrown. Like rock or stone it is o'ergrown, with lichens to the very top, and hung with heavy tufts of moss, a melancholy crop. Up from the earth these mosses creep, and this poor thorn they clasp it round so close, you'd say that they were bent with plain and manifest intent to drag it to the ground. And all had joined in one endeavor to bury this poor thorn forever. High on a mountain's highest ridge, where oft the stormy winter gale cuts like a scythe, while through the clouds it sweeps from vale to vale. Not five yards from the mountain path, this thorn you on your left espy, and to the left three yards beyond, you see a little muddy pond of water never dry. I've measured it from side to side. Tis three feet long and two feet wide. 
and close beside this aged thorn, there is a fresh and lovely sight. A beauteous heap, a hill of moss, just half a foot in height. All lovely colors there you see, all colors that were ever seen. And mossy network too is there, as if by hand of lady fair, the work had woven been, and cups, the darlings of the eye, so deep is their vermilion dye. Ah me, what lovely tints are there, of olive green and scarlet bright, in spikes, in branches, and in stars, green, red, and pearly white. This heap of earth, or grown with moss, which close beside the thorn you see, so fresh in all its beauteous dyes, is like an infant's grave in size, as like as like can be. But never, never anywhere an infant's grave was half so fair. Now would you see this aged thorn, this pond and beauteous hill of moss? You must take care and choose your time, the mountain wind to cross. For oft there sits, between the heap, that's like an infant's grave in size. And that same pond to which I spoke, a woman in scarlet cloak, and to herself she cries, O misery, O misery, O woe is me, O misery. At all times of the day and night, this wretched woman thither goes, and she is known to every star and every wind that blows. And there beside the thorn she sits, when the blue daylight's in the skies, and when the whirlwind's on the hill, or frosty air is keen and still. And to herself she cries, O misery, O misery, O woe is me, O misery. Now wherefore thus, by day and night, in rain, in tempest, and in snow, thus to the dreary mountain top does this poor woman go? And why sits she beside the thorn when the blue daylight's in the sky, or when the whirlwind's on the hill, or frosty air is keen and still? And wherefore does she cry? Oh, wherefore, wherefore? Tell me why does she repeat that doleful cry? I cannot tell. I wish I could. For the true reason no one knows. But if you'd gladly view the spot, the spot to which she goes, the heap that's like an infant's grave, the pond and thorn, so old and gray, pass by her door. Tis seldom shut. And if you see her in her hut, then to the spot away. I never heard of such as dare approach the spot when she is there. But wherefore to the mountain top can this unhappy woman go, whatever star is in the skies, whatever wind may blow? Nay, rack your brain, tis all in vain, I'll tell you everything I know. But to the thorn and to the pond, which is a little step beyond, I wish that you would go. Perhaps when you are at the place, you something of her tale may trace. I'll give you the best help I can before you up the mountain go, up to the dreary mountain top. I'll tell you all I know. Tis now some two and twenty years since she, her name is Martha Ray, gave with a maiden's true good will her company to Stephen Hill. And she was blithe and gay, and she was happy, happy still, whene'er she thought of Stephen Hill. And they had fixed the wedding day, he mourning that must wed them both. But Stephen to another maid had sworn another oath. And with this other maid to church unthinking Stephen went, Poor Martha, on that woeful day, a cruel, cruel fire they say, into her bones was sent. It dried her body like a cinder and almost turned her brain to tinder. They say full six months after this, while yet the summer leaves were green, she to the mountain top would go 
and there was often seen. Tis said, a child was in her womb, as now to any eye was plain. She was with child, and she was mad, yet often she was sober sad from her exceeding pain. Oh me, ten thousand times I'd rather that he had died, that cruel father. Sad case for such a brain to hold communion with the stirring child. Sad case, as you may think, for one who had a brain so wild. Last Christmas when we talked of this, old former Simpson did maintain that in her womb the infant wrought about its mother's heart and brought her senses back again. And when at last her time drew near, her looks were calm, her senses clear. No more I know, I wish I did, and I would tell it all to you. For what became of this poor child, there's none that ever knew. And if a child was born or no, there's no one that could ever tell. And if it was born alive, or dead, there's no one knows, as I have said. But some remember well that Martha Ray, about this time, would up the mountain often climb. And all that winter, when at night the wind blew from the mountain peak, t'was worth your while, though in the dark, the churchyard path to seek. For many a time and oft were heard cries coming from the mountain head. Some plainly living voices were, and others, I have heard many swear, were voices of the dead. I cannot think, whatever they say, they had to do with Martha Ray. But what she goes to this old thorn, the thorn which I have described to you, and there sits in a scarlet cloak, I will be sworn as true. For one day with my telescope, to view the ocean wide and bright, when to this country first I came, ere I had heard of Martha's name, I climbed the mountain's height. A storm came on, and I could see no object higher than my knee. Twas mist and rain, and storm and rain. No screen, no fence could I discover. And then the wind, in faith, it was a wind full ten times over. I looked around, I thought I saw a jutting crag, and off I ran, head foremost, through the driving rain, the shelter of the crag to gain, and, as I am a man, instead of jutting crag, I found a woman seated on the ground. I did not speak, I saw her face, her face it was enough for me, I turned about, and heard her cry, O oh, misery, O oh, misery! And there she sits, until the moon, through half the clear blue sky will go. And when the little breezes make the waters of the pond to shake, as all the country know, she shudders, and you hear her cry, O oh, misery, O oh, misery! But what's the thorn, and what's the pond, and what's the hill of moss to her? And what's the creeping breeze that comes the little pond to stir? I cannot tell, but some will say she hanged her baby on the tree. Some say she drowned it in the pond, which is a little step beyond. But all and each agree the little babe was buried there beneath that hill of moss so fair. I've heard the scarlet moss is red, with drops of that poor infant's blood. But kill a newborn infant thus? I do not think she could. Some say, if to the pond you go, and fix on it a steady view, the shadow of a babe you trace, a baby on a baby's face, and that it looks at you. Whenever you look on it, tis plain the baby looks at you again. And some had sworn an oath that she should go be to public justice brought. And for the little infant's bones, with spades they would have sought. But then the beauteous hill of moss, before their eyes began to stir. 
and for full fifty yards around, the grass it shook upon the ground. But all do still aver the little baby is buried there, beneath that hill of moss so fair. I cannot tell how this may be, but plain it is, the thorn is bound with heavy tufts of moss that strive to drag it to the ground. And this I know, full many a time, when she was on the mountain high, by day and in the silent night, when all the stars shone clear and bright, that I have heard her cry, O oh misery, O oh misery, O oh woe is me, O oh misery. There is one, I made one mistake uh, when I first introduced this poem, and that is to say that in the 1798 version, he didn't, he did not say anything about this poem in the advertisement or the, the first preface, but that's not true. I've, I made a mistake. I forgot. He did say something that is important, and I think it will help um, understand this poem very clearly. But he said, the poem of the thorn as the reader will soon discover, is not supposed to be spoken in the author's own person. The character of the loquacious narrator will sufficiently show itself in the course of the story. So one of the questions you probably loathed, if you were like me, getting in poetry class or like that one time your English teacher in fourth grade gave you a poem to look at and it was horrible like it was for me. If that was your experience, they might have, one of the questions they put as stock questions is, you know, where is this taking place? And who is talking? Who's the narrator? Well, so there is some value to that, though. I don't like the way that they taught it, but there is value in asking who is speaking. And especially in this poem. Because if you read some of words with other poems, it could be him. The Lucy poems, for instance, you could read it as words worth saying it, and that's okay. That works. Here, he specifically says, don't think this is me. And the, the character will show himself. Now, the character is, let's see if I can find this real quick. You know, if you didn't get it your first read through, don't worry about it. Like always, that's okay. So in stanza 16, 17. I do that right? Yeah. We get a, a, a kind of a glimpse into who the narrator is. Now, the narrator is really important. That's the person who's saying this whole poem, it turns out. From the beginning to the end, it's from the one person's perspective, or it's a person talking. And it's not a coincidence that it feels like a lot of words, like it feels like it's long, loquacious. That's part of the issue. So we're going to learn a little bit about this character from Wordsworth's perspective in a minute. I'm going to read to you the note to the 1802 version about the thorn. But here's what we get a, a kind of a glimpse into this character. Let me read the whole poem and I'll point out where it's specifically most important. Well, you, if you're looking online on Facebook or on um, troubadourmag.com, you'll see me highlighting something. But it starts off, but that she goes to this old thorn, the thorn which I've described to you. And there sits in a scarlet cloak, I will be sworn is true. So that's one indication that we know the narrator is the one, that there is a person saying I, right? It's I, so there is an I in this. There's a person who's speaking this. And that person experienced this. So that's very critical. We've talked about that before, about the importance of experiences to the romantics. But it's not just experience um, divorced from meaning, it's ex the experience and meaning, and not meaning divorced from mind. It's how the meaning and the experience and the nature and the environment of that experience and the memory of that experience all imbues itself onto the mind of the person, especially with someone like Wordsworth, but I think all the romantics did that. So he says, I will be sworn as true, and then we get, here's the next, the important part. For one day with my telescope, to view the ocean wide and bright. When to this country first I came, before I had heard of Martha's name, I climbed the mountain's height. A storm came on, and I could see no object higher than my knee. So we learn he, he's a, a ship's captain, and we actually kind of get the uh, hint 
from Wordsworth, but I think there are clues in the poem, but it, it it's, he's criticized to some degree, even though this is a great poem, that he has to kind of tell us, this is called paratext. Um, at least that's what I learned from Coleridge. I never saw that word before. Um, but he's kind of describing outside of the text, what's going on in the text a little bit, which some artists do say is not the best. And I, I know where they're coming from with that. But I think there are hints to it in the poem itself. The problem is that it's kind of complex. So, you know, for one day with my telescope. So he has a telescope to view the ocean. Why? He's viewing the ocean. Uh, went to this country I first came. So he came on a ship. So the idea is that he's a ship's captain. I and mean, that's what you have to know. Now, we learn that he's a retired ship's captain. And that's going to be important. So let me read something from the, um, the note. Okay. Here's what he says in Wordsworth's end notes. Note to the thorn. The character which I have here introduced speaking is sufficiently common. The reader will perhaps have a general notion of it if he has ever known a man, a captain of a small trading vessel, for example, who, being past the middle age of life, had retired upon an annuity or small independent income to some village or country town of which he was not a native or in which he had not been accustomed to live. Such men have little to do, um, have such men having little to do, become credulous and talkative from indolence. I think that's actually a pretty wise observation. You know, you see old people who just, you know, to some degree, annoy young people by talking and talking because they have nothing else to do, right? And so they talk about every little thing. Oh, did you see this little thing? Oh, look at these squirrels. Like, well, hold on a second. I got something to do. I got work. So they don't have the same busyness and they have a different perspective on life. And so they, they sometimes talkative, they become talkative from indolence. But this is a specific kind type of that per, uh, person he's, he's digging into. Let me go on with the end note from Wordsworth. Quote, and from the same cause and other predisposing causes by which it is probable that such men may have been affected, they are prone to superstition. On which account it appeared to me proper to select a character like this to exhibit some of the general laws by which superstition acts upon the mind. So that is a critical part of what he's trying to accomplish with this poem is how superstition acts upon the mind. So when, you know, when you, I've met people like this and I've always wondered if they were serious. Like I really wanted to know, like, are you actually serious? Is this a habit of yours that you got from your grandparents? Like, is this real to you? Where someone's like afraid of a black cat walking under a ladder, spilt salt, or, you know, broken mirror, where someone takes seriously weird superstitions or any superstition. And, you know, so I've, I've met people like this. I've, I've, well, I've dated a girl like that. And I always, I was looked at, it, I was like, are you, I can't tell if this is just like, you've taken this and identity on and you think it's kind of cute or something. And you saw it in some movie or you saw it from your parents and you just kind of casually pick it up. Like I think most people pick up religion. Okay. I've been fine. I can understand that to some degree, but what about what, it, what does it do when you really believe something? So we're getting that in this story of the thorn. We're getting an idea that this guy who he's saying he came to this country and the thorn, by the way, the thorn important fact is a hawthorn bush. So it's actually a bush, not a, um, um, not a, an actual th like thorn that will prick you. Although hawthorns do have thorns on them or they can. But if you remember this one doesn't, he says it doesn't have thorns on it. So just real quick, this is what a British hawthorn might look like. It often has berries on it. Just to, if you were looking on Facebook, but you can, you can Google it. It's, I don't think it's the most critical thing to know, although it, does add to it if you, um, you know, if you, if you have a, a look at it like that. Okay. So he's this, this captain, he views this place and he hears, he says that he sees something, he sees some kind of mystical thing it, with his telescope to view the ocean wide. And he, he ever, before he ever heard this gossip. So the idea of the town gossip is really important. So that's another thing we're going to look at is, Martha's story is the gossip of the town. What happened to the baby? You get all these questions at the end. But notice how he says, 
I came here, right? I, but that she goes to this old thorn. So that this ghost, this person goes to that old thorn that described in the earlier stanza and sits in her red cloak, red like the baby's blood. I, the captain, will be sworn as true. Why, what proof does he have? So again, you can imagine him talking at a bar with people. He says, well, ha -ha, for one day with my telescope to view the ocean wide and bright, when to this country first I came, before I had heard of Martha's name, I climbed the mountain's height. A storm came on, and I could see no object higher than my knee. So that, well, all of a sudden we should be thinking, wait a second, you couldn't see anything higher than your knee? But you, you were in this telescope and you're seeing something on the mountain on your ship? Ah, uh, wait a second. And then he goes on, though, and kind of defeats his own purpose. But th this is kind of what Wordsworth is interested in, these um, obscurities. Like, why would this guy obscure his own story? He should say it was a clear day. I saw everything. She was clearly right in front of him. But in the mind of a superstitious person, they often will describe it in ways that make you almost question if it's real at all. And, you know, and like, wait, is he telling the truth? Is this, why is it so foggy and vague, right? Twas mist and rain and storm and rain. No screen, no fence could I discover. And then the wind and faith, it was a wind full time, 10 times over. It was like a, he's a huge storm this guy's in. I looked around and thought, I thought I saw a jutting crag and off I ran head foremost through the driving rain, the shelter of the crag to gain. And as I am a man, instead of jutting crag, I found a woman seated on the ground. I did not speak. I saw her face. Her face it was enough for me. I turned about and heard her cry, Oh misery, oh misery. And there she sits until the moon, through half the clear blue sky will go. And when the little breezes make the waters of the pond shake, as all the country know, she shudders, then you hear her cry, Oh misery, oh misery as all the country know, right? So he's becoming a part of the community gossip here, right? And we get these questions, but what's the thorn and what's the pond and what's the hill of moss to her? And what's the creeping breeze and com that comes the little pond to stir? I cannot tell, but some will say she hanged her baby on the tree. So this is part of the gossip. She hanged her baby on the tree. Some say she drowned it in the pond, which is a little step beyond, but all in each agree the little babe was buried there beneath that hill of moss so fair. Now, if you remember in earlier time, in the earlier stanzas, we got an idea that maybe she's not pregnant. Maybe she is right. The truth of her pregnancy or not pregnancy, the truth of her hanging her baby or drowning her baby or coming back to life. All those things are actually somewhat irrelevant because that's not what Wordsworth is interested in. So here's a quote from Wordsworth in the end note again. Superstitious men are almost always men of slow faculties and deep feelings. Their minds are not loose, but adhesive, like tape, stick, stuff sticks to it. They have a reasonable share of imagination, by which word I mean the faculty which produces impressive effects out of simple elements. I see something, you know, like a cloud. I see... Uh, is kind of shaped like a head, and I see Zeus, his thunderbolts, and all the gods all of a sudden, right? Like, that. that is kind of what the imagination is. is you're, you're kind of playing with clouds in the sky. And in this case, he's seeing in the thorn bush this with, that has red cherries on it, this hawthorn bush, he's seeing a red woman, a woman wrapped in a red cloak, and this is this whole gossip story of this woman who goes and haunts this area because she killed her own child because she was abandoned by her husband. But they, I'm going on. I mean the faculty which produces impressive effects out of simple elements, but they are utterly destitute of fancy. The power by which pleasure and surprise are excited by sudden varieties of situation and by accumulated imagery. Now my take on Wordsworth at this point, and I don't want this to be definitive, but my take on what Wordsworth is saying in terms of fancy and um, imagination, because he has a different view than Coleridge, slightly different, or the, the, although they seem to go back and forth, is that Coleridge views that there's two kinds of imagination, and that fancy is different in kind, it's a different nature, different phenomenon altogether, whereas 
Wordsworth believes that they're actually similar in kind. And I think for Wordsworth, fancy integrates the sensations that hit our five senses into percepts, the things we see, essentially, I mean, or the things we hear and see and taste and touch. But those percepts, the things that come into our senses, can be manipulated via the imagination into artistic creation. And that's a, that's a conscious um, effect of, or a conscious effort of will. Whereas Coleridge, you know, um, he views, his, views the, there's a distinctive distinction between primary and, and uh, secondary. And primary is the faculty by which we perceive the world around us, period. And there's, he goes on and on about this. Um, it is merely the power of receiving impressions of the external through our senses. It perceives objects both in their uh, parts and as a whole. So it's basically what automatically, everybody has that. So uh, primary is possessed by everyone. Now, secondary imagination is what makes artistic creation possible. Not guaranteed, but possible. And it requires an effort of the will and conscious effort. It works upon what is perceived by the primary imagination. Its raw materials are the sensations and impressions supplied to it by the primary imagination. Now, what I think, you know, why I think this is important for what's going on in this particular poem is that what happens when the imagination, whether you think of that as the fancy, the secondary imagination, what happens when you think that it's real? Right? I mean, so if you saw, if you ever watched Friends, there's that episode of Friends where Joey is being stalked by a woman who believes he's actually the doctor on TV, Drake Ramore. And so she has a disconnect between, you know, imagination and reality. And there's something here going on too, where there's these uh, gossips going on, where people are telling this story and the captain, this retired, indolent, bored guy who's got nothing going on, he's living in a new area, so he's trying to match, you know, he's trying to get to know everybody to, uh, in a certain degree. And so he becomes involved in the, in the mythology, and he convinces himself that he saw this thing before he ever heard of the story of Martha Ray. But did he actually? Now, if we go through it again carefully, and we don't have time to go through it too much. If there's interest, um, let me know, and I can go more deeply into this poem. But if we read like the first couple stanzas, so we say, there is a thorn. It looks so old. In truth, you'd find it hard to say how it could ever have been young. It looks so old and gray, not higher than a two years child. It stands erect, this aged thorn. No leaves it has, no thorny points, no thorny points. It is a mass of knotted joints, a wretched thing forlorn. It stands erect, and like a stone, with lichens it is overgrown. So we have this hawthorn bush that's really old, and it, you, know, you couldn't imagine that the hawthorn bush was ever young. I think you can kind of see that as you, we now know what's going on in the poem, we may be able to say that this is a metaphor for the old woman. I don't, I don't think that would be a stretch. So she's this old woman. She's shrunk down. You know, the bush is no, not higher than a two years child. It stands erect, this aged thorn. It's, it doesn't have thorny points. It doesn't have leaves. It's just a matted, you know, jo all the knotted joints of this th hawthorn bush. Just like an old woman might be like that. Next stanza. Like rock or stone, it is o'ergrown with lichens to the very top and hung with heavy tufts of moss, like gathered together like clumps of moss, a melancholy crop. So we're getting this, you know, plain image of this um, the Hawthorne described by Wordsworth, or I should, excuse me, I should say, described by the narrator. And the narrator would take it to be this captain. So he's telling this story. And he's, he's telling it in a very interesting way. And now we start, when, and at first he kind of tells it a little bit more plainly, right? Like he, he analogizes it to, or, you know, uh, compares it to a two years child and, and height. But then he, but it's mostly, you know, it's a, a wretched thing is forlorn. So he's giving it these emotional connotations right off the bat. So, I mean, just imagine someone's telling a spooky story and they're telling you of this, you know, you know like that stereotypical scary tree that, 
you know, like haunts the, like think about if you saw the conjuring movie, the poster, it was like this gray, scary tree. And of course they have the, the noose on it. So that's pretty scary by itself. Um, but the point is that, that there's a kind of connotation that trees aren't scary in and of themselves, right? It's a tree is just, there is a thorn. It, it looks old. A truth. You would find it hard to say how it could ever have been young. It looks so old and gray. But then all of a sudden we get all these metaphors of two years child. Um, no thorny points, jo- not a joints forlorn. Right? So it looks, it's a wretched thing forlorn. So we, we get a base. So the point is you get a base description of it and then you get an emotional connection. Wretched thing forlorn. Like rock or stone, it is or grown with lichens to the very top and hung with heavy tufts of moss, a melancholy crop. Up from the earth, we could definitely do something about the meter at some point. <laughs> like rock or stone. It is this is an iambic pentameter, but he breaks it at specific times and hung with heavy tufts of moss, a melancholy crop. Up from the earth, these mosses creep, and this poor thorn they clasp it round, so close you'd say that they were bent with plain and manifest intent to drag it to the ground, and all had joined in one endeavor to bury this poor thorn forever. Now, I think that this is a metaphor for the community burying the story of the thorn. So you have an outsider, a captain, who comes into this new area. He claims to not have known this story, but he probably did. And he, we discover at the beginning whether the, you know, and, and again, this is where you're going to have a lot of arguments with critics, uh, or you'll see a lot of arguments with critics about who the narrator is. It very well could be that these first two stanzas are not the captain. It, it, that's where it gets confusing. So it's just some random person just describing the, the general idea that the town is burying this thorn, right? Um, up from the earth these mosses creep and this poor thorn they clasp it round so close you'd say that they were bent with plain and manifest intent to drag it to the ground right they're, they're intent on dragging it to the ground and all had joined and all who's all the whole community had joined in one endeavor to bury this poor thorn forever so they're trying to bury the thorn but if the thorn is the old woman it, it could be her whole story they're trying to bury that high on a mountain's highest ridge where off the stormy winter gale Cuts like a scythe, while through the clouds it sweeps from vale to vale. Not five yards from the mountain path, this thorn you you on your left espy. And to the left, three yards beyond, you see a little muddy pond of water, never dry. I've measured it from side to side, tis three feet long and two feet wide. And close beside this aged thorn, there is a fresh and lovely sight. A beauteous heap, a hill of moss, just half a foot in height. All lovely colors... There you see all colors that were ever seen. And mossy network too is there, as if by hand of Lady Fair the work had woven been. And cups the darlings of the eye, so deep is their vermilion dye. So we're getting more description of this whole area, right? It's on a mountain's ridge. Um, off, there's often stormy winter gales it, that cut like a scythe. So this is called enjambment. We're off, so this is important here. When reading poetry, you need to understand what enjambment is. So this is the thought, where off the stormy winter gale cuts like a scythe. You could write that out in one line. Although because he wants to get the meter right, he you split it up. Where often the wind, the stormy winter gale cuts like a scythe. So it's one thought right there. That's why he doesn't have a comma after gale. Right? You'll notice that you'll have punctuation at the end of most sentence or at the end of most lines. That's not enjambment. So enjambment is when the, the thought continues into the next line, where often the stormy winter gale cuts like a scythe, while through the clouds it sweeps from vale to vale. Right? That's one thought. While through the clouds it sweeps from vale to vale. The storm. Not five yards from the mountain path, the thorn... So this. So now we're starting to see, okay, so this is a person describing this area to someone. So who the heck is the narrator and who is he talking to? So not five yards from the mountain path. You know, that one over there by, you know, Jimmy's place. Yeah, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. The thorn uh, that's going to be on your left and to the left three yards beyond. That's what we're talking about. 
and you'll see a little muddy pond of water that's never dry. I've measured it from side to side to three meter feet long and two feet wide. And close beside this aged thorn, there is a fresh and lovely sight, a beauteous heap, a hill of moss, a hill of, I'll just think of green moss, just half a foot in height. So there's this green mound of moss that's half a foot in height. All lovely colors there you see, all colors that were ever seen. And mossy network too is there, as if by hand of Lady Fair. So it's like this the whole area is made by a woman. Hmm. Well, this Thornus story is about a woman named Martha Ray. So maybe it's her doing. Maybe she had some view, you know, creation uh, or some idea of that. That's that's how the narrator's taking it. Okay, so remember, he has a superstitious idea that this ghost is here, but he's crazy, or is he? Right? As if by hand of Lady Fair, the work had woven been, and cups the darling of the eye, so deep, so deep is their vermilion dye. Ah me, what lovely tints are there, of olive green and scarlet bright, in spikes and branches and in stars, green, red, and pearly white. This heap of earth, though grown with moss, which close beside the thorn you see, so fresh in all its beauteous dyes, is like an infant's grave in size, as like as like can be. But never, never anywhere, any infant's grave was half so fair. Was half so fair. So we have this lovely scene, right? Or this very interesting scene built by a person, like cultivated like a garden. This is the woman Martha Ray's garden. Is this grave? Is it a grave? We're getting a hint that it is. Because it's like an infant's grave in size. Is it like an infant's grave in size? Or is it, is it an infant's grave and that's why it's like an infant's grave in size? Maybe that's why it's like that, right? And it's very beautiful in its own way. But of course, but never, never anywhere, an infant's grave was half this fair. This is the most beautiful infant's grave. That's a creepy thought. How would you see this aged thorn, this pond and beauteous... By the way, that's a creepy thought, and it's going through the captain's mind. That's what he is saying. So that's important when we're thinking about, like, wait a second, why is this guy relaying the story in this way? And this is the state of excitement of the superstition, uh, the superstitious mind that he was trying to figure out. Uh, Hawthorne, that is, is trying to figure out and trying to ex express. So just to kind of go off on that a little, let me read a little bit more from the um, end note, and then I'd like to wrap up here in a minute. It was my wish in this poem to show the, the quote, it was my wish in this poem to show the manner in which such men cleave to the same ideas. Okay, so it's how men cleave to this idea that he's, he's obsessed with, the captain is obsessed with having seen this ghost and being a part of this whole community. And to follow the turns of passion, always different, yet not palpably different, by which their conversation is swayed. So when you watch someone talk, this is always something interesting to do, is watch how they get excited, their ups and their downs, especially when it's a gabby, talky, loquacious individual. You'll see how they go up and they get really excited about something when they're talking. You, you'll, if you watch me enough, you'll definitely see I get really excited about this. And then it's like, oh, okay, I get into this. I get, hopefully I'm not too monotone. Right. And even though I'm excited about this, you know, I, I hope that there's some value in you seeing just more of an off the cuff conversation about these poems. That's part of the goal. So, in which uh, men cleave to these ideas, quote, and to follow the turns of passion, always different, yet not palpably different, by which their conversation is swayed. I had two objects to obtain. First, to represent a picture of which should not be unimpressive, yet consistent with the character that should describe it. Second, while I adhere to the style in which such persons describe, to take care that words, which in their minds are impregnated with passion, should likewise convey passion to readers who are not accustomed to sympathize with men feeling in that manner or using such language. So in other words, he's saying he's using meter and language to convey um, this crazy person's mind the way that he perceives it. So presumably Wordsworth had met individuals like this who were, and I think we all kind of have, it's like that superstitious person. I, or I wrote a, a post on Facebook, how superstitious people in the 1700s and 1800s 
don't exist in the way that they used to, right? Where they're using tinctures and potions to cure things and they're burning witches, right? Who they think maybe had something to do with their child dying. Like that type of superstition isn't really as prevalent in the West anymore. But today we have the conspiracy theorist. And I think those two are very similar. They see, you know, they, they tend to not be the most acute minds. They tend to not be very good at parsing out similarities and differences and, and digging into uh, with precision and clarity ideas that their mind doesn't seem to require for some reason enough evidence, right? And that's, we get that with this person too, where he says with his telescope, he sees something and in his own mind, it's a stormy night and he can't see beyond his knees, but somehow he sees this thing on the hill, right? And that's the kind of absurdity that you get with conspiracy theorists. Where it's like, we're supposed to believe that with all these things in the way, because you have one or two little bits of information that don't quite fit into the overall narrative that you picked out, that somehow this means there's this grand conspiracy, right? And that, you know, we didn't go to the moon. And so it's more, you know, and so then they've convinced themselves that it's, <laughs> it's possible that there's this huge conspiracy with tens of thousands of people who've seen involved in the conspiracy itself to put the wool over everyone's eyes. But that's likely or possible, but going to the moon isn't, right? And so they convince themselves of their impossibilities, just like this captain convinced himself that he saw this thing and he wants to tell people about it rather than it was just the red berries on the bush that he saw, right? In the, in the storm. And they're just, it looked like she was wrapped in something. And then that's it. He had heard this story somewhere before he came here. He just didn't remember. And the story was just implanted in his mind and that's it. It's as simple as that, but he won't, he won't do that because right? he's got a superstitious mind. Okay. So I want to wrap up. I'm not going to read the rest of the poem, but I want to read a couple um, quick stanzas to give you an idea of some of the things I, to, to kind of hammer home some of the things I've been saying. So in stanza seven, he says, at all times of the day and night, this wretched woman thither goes, and she is known to every star and every wind that blows. So in stanza six, I should say, um, after he's described the, the thorn bush, he then talks about, well, do you see a woman in a scarlet cloak? And to herself, she cries, oh, misery, oh, misery, oh, woe is me, oh, misery. And then he goes on in, chapter, in uh, stanza seven, to talk about that, that person at all times of the day and night, the wretched woman there goes. And there beside the thorn, she sits when the blue days lights in the skies, when the blue daylights in the skies and when the whirlwinds on the hill or, or frosty air is keen and still and to herself. She cries, Oh misery, Oh misery, Oh woe is me, Oh misery. So now, okay. Now watch what happens here. Now wherefore thus, by day and night, in rain and tempest and in snow, thus to the dreary mountaintop does this woman, poor woman go? So either the, the guy is asking this to his audience, or someone in the audience is maybe asking him, why does she go here? And why sits she beside the thorn when the blue daylight's in the sky, or when the whirlwind's on the hill, or frosty air is keen and still? So my guess is that this is still supposed to be the narrator. That's words with intent. Is this the idea of him cleaving to the same ideas? He's kind of repeating it to himself and saying, why does she do that? Right? It's like, so I saw her here. That's the story. But why? Or when the whirlwind's on the hill or frosty air, you know, and why does she cry? Or why? Oh, why? Tell me why does she repeat that doleful cry? He keeps asking why. And now this is almost funny. I cannot tell. I wish I could. <laughs> For the true reason, no one knows. But if you'd gladly view the spot, the spot to which she goes, the heap that like uh, an infant's grave, the pond and thorn so old and gray, pass by her door to seldom shut. And if you see her in her hut, then to the spot away. I never heard of such as dare approach the spot when she is there. Right. So come with me and let's see this. Right. Or, or you should go and see it for yourself. He's like the old quack in a village who's telling these stories, but he's actually a newcomer to this village. But wherefore did the mountain top? Can this unhappy woman go? Whatever star is in the sky, whatever wind may blow, nay, rack your brain till tis all in vain. I'll tell you everything I know. Right? So it's just like a person saying, Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's have a beer. Buy me another beer and I'll tell you. But to the thorn and to the pond, which is a little step beyond, I wish that you would go. See for yourself at some point. Perhaps when you are at the place, you something of her tale may trace. 
I'll give you the best help that I can before you up the mountain go. Up to the tre- dreary mountain up top, I'll tell you all I know. To some now, t- tis now some twenty two and twenty years, twenty two years ago, since she, her name is Martha Ray, gave her the maiden's true goodwill, her company to Stephen Hill. So she's going to marry this guy, Stephen Hill. But of course, he betrays her. Right, That's where you learn in the next stanza. And then, um, now, what it does to her is pretty horrible. On that woeful day, a cruel, cruel fire. So we have this fire within her. This is metaphorical, of course, but there's also something to it because we know what happens to her. Right, She kills her kid, or that's the story. There's a fire. It went into her bones. It dried her body like a cinder and almost turned her brain to tinder, which isn't maybe that much different than what's happening to the narrator, perhaps. Not as extreme, but still. So six months later, after the, yet the summer leaves were green, she to the mountaintop would go. And there was often seen to set a child. Was, it's said that there was a child in her womb. And now uh, to any eye was plain. Although he wasn't there, the narrator's not there. He's just telling you what he heard as was with child, and she was mad, yet often she was sober sad from her exceeding pain. Oh, me, ten thousand times I'd rather that he had died, that cruel father. So that that's like the you know, person saying, that damn father shouldn't have done that. It's all his fault, right? Sad case for such a brain to hold communion with a stirring child. Sad case, as you may think, for one who has had a brain so wild. Wild. Last Christmas, when we talked of this, old farmer Simpson did maintain. So again, he's relaying gossip. He's like, it's laid out here that he's just relaying gossip and he's in reinforcing his own story. And this is the kind of turns of passion that Wordsworth is interested in. Like how this, so this is supposed to be an artist creating how an actual crazy person, mutable madness, how they actually talk if they were a real person, right? He's developing a character that you might see in a novel. But he's developing it here in this poem. He, you want to get a, he wants to get a whole sense for that person. Okay, so I've I um, skipped a couple stanzas, but I think you have a good approach to this. Um, yeah, I started here on, uh, so I skipped like four stanzas in there. But I've I've read a, this whole thing, most of it, twice already. So I hope that that gives you a good approach to this. If you're interested in a deeper reading, we could go even deeper. This is one of the great poems from Wordsworth, um, one of his many great poems, but this one's up there as one of the greatest of all time. And part of it is, you know, the way he uses the language. I mean, you could even read how he changes the syllable structure uh, of each stanza. So stanza eight has a very specific syllable structure. He he changes it at in stanza two slightly at the very end of the stanza when we get to the idea that he wants to stress in the meter that the community is tearing down this um, tree and burying the story. And then you have this gossip guy who's bringing it back to life, right? So there's, he, he's um, using meter also in the way that the person's the language. So he, he'll break it up once in a while to kind of jar your uh, hearing in order to see the kind of insanity of this person. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for sticking around for this a uh, little bit longer than normal. I try to keep them under an hour, uh, but I think it's worth it. I think this is a good poem to study, and I hope you'll go, you know, return to this poem. Thank you very much for watching or listening to Sunday Morning Poetry on the Troubadour Podcast, and I'll see you next time.